We are very happy to welcome uh, Director Jen Easterly in a conversation with Mark Rogers from Okta. But first, we are very happy to welcome Craig Newmark to actually introduce Jen. And so I'll turn things over to Craig, who's dialing in with us virtually. Hey, folks. I'm uh, Craig Newmark. I'm the founder of Craig Newmark Philanthropies, also the founder of something called Craigslist. The ransomware hey, task force. There we go. Now, now we can hear you. We couldn't hear you for a second there. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm Craig Newmark. I founded something called Craig Newmark Philanthropies, funding a lot of activities in the uh, cyberspace. I'm also the founder of something called Craigslist. Now, the ransomware task force is about protecting us all from people who wish us harm. This is a really big deal. Earlier this month, I launched something I'm calling the Cyber Civil Defense Initiative, naming it that because I was among the first generation of duck and cover. And I was seriously delighted to welcome the Institute for Security and Technology among its founding participants. Now the Cyber Civil Defense Initiative works to help protect everyone, to help everyone protect their homes, businesses, and to protect the country. It's kind of like World War II, everyone was expected to play a role. And the ransomware task force is a big part of that. Now Mark Rogers is a longtime hacker and he's a serious leader in the security community. He's advancing public-private partnerships, particularly in healthcare. Jen plays a really big role protecting the country via CISA, and I really appreciate her work on the Cyber Civil Defense Initiative. I've seen firsthand that she's the real deal. With that, I welcome Mark Rogers and Director, Lee, Director Easterly. Technology's hard. Yep, good. Does that work? Yay. All right. And mine? Yep. Okay. All right. Okay. Wow. Um, I have to say, I'm kind of blown away to, to have been given this opportunity. Uh, CISA has been uh, an agency that has, I'm, I'm a huge fan of. Um, I worked with your predecessor on setting up a, a group called the CTI League and have many friends who have joined CISA and folks in CISA have become friends. Um, I, I see you guys as kind of being the heart of innovation when it comes to tackling cybersecurity. So um, one of the first questions I had is, like, how are you going to continue this and how are you going to scale this? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, first of all, thank you for doing this. Equally honored to be here with you. And thank you to everybody here, my friend Phil, uh, for uh, hosting this and uh, the amazing work of the task force over the past year. So I'm really glad that I was able to make this event. Uh, it won't surprise you to know that I'm a big fan of CISA as well. Um, and a big fan of my predecessor, Chris Krebs, a very close friend of mine who, of course, founded the agency. Um, you know, it's a bit of a gift, actually, to be the second director of the youngest uh, agency in the federal government, because we do have uh, the ability to do things different. And that's really how we're working to position CISA, not just another government bureaucracy, but something that's truly uh, innovative and can be agile. And, you know, I look for evidence of bureaucracy every day so that we can kill it and figure out a way to be innovative. And when we were talking about what we wanted to be, what we aspire to be, what we expect from our teammates, you know, I probably spent um, a significant amount of the last 10 months uh, building our culture, building our core values from collaboration to innovation, to service, to accountability, the core principles of what we expect from each other. And a lot of it is about how do we imagine, how do we anticipate, how do we innovate, 
And so we are really sort of an organization with innovation and collaboration baked in because I, you know, from my experience in the private sector, if we act like another, you know, bureaucracy, the private sector is not going to, not going to want to work with us, not going to know how to work with us. So I think that's just incredibly important and kind of core to our ethos. Um, and everybody knows it sort of starts from the top. So I make it very clear that we are looking for new ways and creative ways of doing things. And we are looking to slay the bureaucratic dragons uh, wherever we see them and come up with new ways of, of solving really tough problems. With that in context, what would you say your top priorities are? Yeah. Well, you know, obviously, Mark, there's a ton of operational priorities um, uh, given what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, given what continues to go on with ransomware. I think in the short term, um, the priorities sort of focus around three, three things. First of all, continuing to build the culture, because I'm a huge believer that, you know, to create a world-class organization, you have to create a world-class culture. And so I'm spending a ton of time on that because it's all about ensuring that your culture focuses on empowering your people, uh, inspiring your people and making sure that they feel impactful every day. So that's that's something I spend a lot of time on. Uh, the second one is really on collaboration. And this has to do with a lot of what you and I have been talking about on the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative, something that we established uh, last August. And we've been building it over the last nine months, have gotten a lot of traction working closely with the private sector, whether it's Log4j, whether it's on ransomware, whether it's on Ukraine, and so really building a different model of collaboration where it's not just about information sharing, but it's about information enabling. Um, and it's not just about partnership, right? It's truly about operational collaboration. How can we share information in real time so that we can together build those dots, connect those dots, drive down risk to the nation at scale? And I think the, the last near-term big thing that I'm really working on is how we communicate to the American people. Right, we're all, I'm sure a lot of technical folks in here. Um, if you are speaking nerd speak to the American people, for example, multi-factor authentication, their eyes glaze over. And at the end of the day, whether it's reducing risk from a nation state attack or whether it's reducing risk from ransomware, I think our key role and one of the most important things we can do is help the American people build resilience, right? What is the basics that we need to be doing, whether it's enabling multi-factor authentication, uh, whether it's updated software, good password hygiene, how to train people on how to identify illegitimate emails, phishing emails. And so communicating that to the American people in a way that it really resonates is something that I'm spending a lot of time doing. It's why I was excited to come here. Um, but it's something that I would welcome your help with as well. We're gonna kick off a campaign here in a little while um, because multi-factor authentication, you say that to people who are non-technical and their eyes glaze over and they move on to something else because it sounds scary. And so really at the end of the day, it's uh, more than a password, right? Little hashtag more than a password. And I like it because it sounds like Boston's more than a feeling. So we can get a little bit of rock music in there as well. But it really, at the end of the day, it's, you know, stop talking about the flux capacitor. How do we translate uh, what, Amer what the American people need to understand uh, to be able to protect themselves? We've had years of experiencing exactly the same problem in, uh, in private sector. As a security practitioner, if you go to your board and say, you've got the following vulnerabilities and the following obscure pieces of software, they're just going to look at you blankly. Okay. Um, communication is absolutely key to getting the right kind of prioritization. So... This resonates really well, um, and I, I, I look forward to like, getting the rest of my colleagues to provide support on this. Um, and this, I think, it speaks to this, uh, you know, the public-private collaboration that has been emerging and is growing. Um, how are you planning to scale that in a way that it can be sort of tighter and less them and us, and more we are one team fighting one threat? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, um, I'd never been in the Department of Homeland Security before, so I didn't really know what to expect from this job. I spent time in the Army. I spent time in the intelligence community at NSA. I was at Help Stand Up Cybercom. I was the White House. And, you know, it's interesting because in those fields, whether it's intelligence or the Army or 
counterterrorism, the federal government arguably has monopoly power. But in the world of cybersecurity, uh, the federal government is just a co-equal partner with the private sector and with our state and local colleagues. And so it really is all about how do you create, most important word is trust. How do you create trusted collaborative partnerships so the government doesn't seem like uh, they're this black box where information goes in, but it never comes out, um, where it, it feels like the government is actually providing information of value uh, of relevance that is actionable. And so we are working really hard to build that connectivity um, so that we can together raise the baseline in cybersecurity of the nation. And a lot of that is how do you create trusted partnerships at scale, I think is the key word. We of course manage uh, what's called CPAC, the Critical Infrastructure Partnership Advisory Council, where we work with all of the sectors, all of the sector risk management agencies, um, to build those partnerships together. And so we have this sort of platform that's already built between the federal government and the private sector. But the thing that I'm probably most excited about is this Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative because it is for the first time in law, it's the only federal uh, cyber platform that says, okay, you need to have CISA and FBI and NSA, and we brought in Cybercom and DOD and DOJ and ODNI and Secret Service. So you have the whole federal cyber ecosystem together, along with the ingenuity of industry and the innovation of the private sector and uh, what's happening at the state and local level and a lot of work we're doing now with nonprofits. So it really does, um, it, it, it's emblematic of what I often say that cyber is a team sport. And I think we need to go into this, my view from having spent the last four and a half years in the private sector um, with a lot of humility. Um, at the end of the day, this is really, we can't solve it, private sector can't solve it. And so we need to figure out how we can work together, how we can build that trust, how we can take honest feedback on, actually that doesn't make any sense. Or, you know, it's why we share a lot of our products in advance with our JCDC partners, because we wanna get that input from experts who are doing this in industry or working in critical infrastructure so that we can make sure that it's actually effective. And so scaling the model that we've built with JCDC, we just brought in ICS partners, for example. We work with obviously international partners, over a hundred certs. Um, and then with our alliance partners and as part of Ukraine, we work very closely with 22 big banks, 38 energy companies. And so continuing to scale that model something you and I have talked about before, Mark, is you know, we want to scale it in a way that's of value, but we also want to maintain that trust. And so figuring out how to get that balance right, where we protect people's privacy, we protect people's data, people's information. Um, I want to make sure that we're not scaling too fast so that we um, end up in a space where we're not able to do that. Because at the end of the day, you will lose trust really quickly and it's hard to build back as you know. Yep. And one of the challenges is you don't just have to scale this. We're going to have to change the speed of operation because um, threat actors don't sit around. You know, they come in, they do as much damage as they can. Uh, their profitability is often driven by the fact that they can catch people by surprise, catch organizations by surprise. And Frequently, the, the golden window in which you can take action that's going to mitigate and minimize the amount of operational damage is very narrow. And so how do we take something like a partnership such as JCDC and connect you know, operator to operator and have you know, folks from the organizations in JCDC who are operators as opposed to, say, spokespeople, or leaders, or lawyers with like the operators within CISA, the operators within other agencies? Yeah. Um, so two-part answer to that. First off, one of the first things um, that I said to the senior folks who are part of the JCDC, we actually met with a bunch of folks out in, in uh, uh, the Valley in December, was if you want to bring your government person, that's fine. But at the end of the day, to make this partnership work, we need you to bring your operators to the table and your technical people to the table. And um, that's actually moved in a really good direction. So we're not here arguing over legal issues. Um, we are actually sharing information in real time of value so that we can create that threat picture. So 
Um, we have, we realized that that was going to be a problem from the beginning and we worked really hard to sort of set the table so that folks knew if you want to be part of this, it's not a club, it's an engine. If you want to be part of this engine, then you need to bring your game and we will bring everything we've got as a government. We're not holding back on sharing anything that we have that we think can help reduce risk to the nation. So that's important. The second thing I'd said is that, you know, how do you, you asked, how do you build off this? So the other thing I'm excited about and why I really wanted to come spend time here is, of course, we know the recent omnibus legislation had uh, Searsha, which I like to call Searsha, like Searsha Ronan, because we thought it was going to be Sira, and then they, they changed the spelling on us. Um, of course, has the cyber incident reporting, which I think is hugely important to help us baseline the attacks on critical infrastructure and the ransomware reporting. Um, but more excitingly, it talked about creating a joint ransomware task force, which actually was the brainchild of the IST ransomware task force. And so, and it gave me the great privilege to establish that. And so what I wanted to announce today is we're actually kicking it off. We're very excited about it. Um, we think that this will actually build really nicely on the infrastructure and the scaffolding that we've developed with JCDC to use what we have as part of the federal cyber ecosystem, the companies that are part of the JCDC Alliance to plug into the hub as envisioned in the ransomware task force report. Uh, and you know, the legislation says that I, as the assistant director will establish it, but given what's in that legislation and what, what the task force is envisioned to do, there's a lot of disruption of ransomware actors, infrastructure finances. I thought it was really important that the FBI co-chairs and so the operational leads will be Eric Goldstein, my head of cyber, and Brian Vordram, uh, who's head of FBI cyber. And we're working with the National Cyber Director to bring in the rest of the federal government. But um, in very short order, we want to work with you all, and we've already been working with you all, as you know, but really have that direct plug-in to the ransomware threat focus hub so that we can actually start operationalizing progress in an agile way, disrupting these actors. We're on the resilience defense side, but we want to work with all of our partners across the federal cyber ecosystem and the industry to actually be able to go after these actors in a very agile way at scale. This is awesome. Right. Um, no, it is. It, I'm, uh, as a member of the, the Ransomware Threat Focus Hub, and I, I speak for my colleagues, I think this is exactly the kind of thing that we've been hoping to hear. Um, so it's really awesome to hear it. Um, my first immediate ask is, how can we shape this so that we tightly integrate what we're doing? So rather than being us, you know, as a an attachment doing stuff and passing it up, we bring folks from your organization in, we bring folks from FBI in, and we we mix up. And so we share skills and, you know, teach all we know and learn all you know so that we become one team. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's exactly what we want to do. So wonder to empower is activated. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and again, I think we're building on the infrastructure that we developed in the JCDC, which is changing the model, right? Even when I was at Morgan Stanley and before then, this government, this private public partnership thing was about, okay, I'm gonna go to a government office or I'm gonna go down to DC or I'm gonna go to a field office or I'm gonna go to headquarters. I'm gonna have this meeting and maybe we exchange business cards and then we meet again, you get a threat briefing every quarter. Like those days are gone. We cannot help defend and protect the nation if we're looking at it that way. We all have to be in the room all the time sharing information constantly so that we can create that picture together because it's very likely that industry is going to see a cyber attack on the homeland before we see it at the end of the day. So we have to be in the same room. We have to trust each other. Um, and, you know, trusting each other is a little bit of a leap of faith. And, you know, there's going to be some screw ups, I'm sure. But I fundamentally believe as a human that you have to treat feedback as a gift. Um, and so we got to work together and we got to figure out how to get this right. And so I'm excited about, you know, we're continuing to build the con ops around this. I think we're looking to kick off the first official meeting here in the next few months um, as we bring all this together. But 
Um, you know, all all uh, feedback, all players, are, all partners are welcome, but we have to be in this together. It can't be like the government and the private sector. It has to be, we are sort of, you know, team cyber. It's like you're I might steal your CTI league or something from, you know, Hall of Justice versus Legion of Doom. Yeah. yeah. Um, this fight has to be sort of reflective. Um, and as much as we look to the federal government and uh, our law enforcement partners to taking action, we also have to sort of do some introspection. How do you think we in the private sector are doing in terms of uh, tackling ransomware, in terms of following the guidance under shields up you know yeah i mean it's i think we've made progress right if you saw a report this morning i guess from chain analysis um looked pretty dire this was 2021 numbers um you know and, and and i think it is still pretty bad in terms of the ransomware ecosystem now that said like we don't know but actually the baseline is reporting that's why the legislation will be helpful to help us create that baseline um, but at the end of the day, as you know, as everybody in this room knows, this is not a problem to be solved. This is a persistent issue. And what it takes is obviously all of the things we can do on the offensive side with disruption. And, and that is great and important the stuff that Treasury is doing on cryptocurrencies, what DOJ is doing. I think the most important thing, certainly what we're focused on is America's Cyber Defense Agency, is how do you raise the bar on cybersecurity and resilience. And you mentioned Shields Up. That's what that's all about. That is what that's all about. And so if you go to that website, you can learn about the threats, but it's what are the basics that I need to do as a business, large and small, to raise that baseline? What should I be doing as a CEO to empower my CISO? What should I be doing as an individual? Enable multi-factor authentication, you know, and all the stuff that we've been doing on ransomware. And I think we have made some good progress. Part of it is off the back of some of the great work you have done. Part of it is the federal government coming together. You know, we created that one-stop shop, stopransomware.gov, um, which has been really popular in terms of getting the message out. One of the things that I'm most pleased about over the past year is we are now operating much, operating much more coherently as a government. So if you look at the products that CIS has been putting out, you will almost always see, see a multi-seal. Right, you'll see CISA, you'll see FBI, you'll probably see NSA, you might see Five Eyes Partners. We just did one with the Netherlands. And that's because we are all in this together. And frankly, I wanna make sure we as a government are sending a coherent signal. Because when I was in the private sector and I saw just something from CISA and maybe something different from NSA and something different from FBI, I just found that to be confusing. And so the more we can speak with one coherent, cohesive voice, in particular, with the international community and a lot of our products now benefit from industry input. And so as long as we can all get that together, I think that can make a huge difference in the direction that we're going. I mean, I, I do think you guys are nailing the communications piece. Um, in, in my role in private sector, I have to do a lot of uh, communication, a lot of awareness notification, and almost every single deck I put out now has the CISA top 20 vulnerabilities in it with metrics around you know, how these things are being exploited. But it also loops back to the fact that many of these vulnerabilities are really, really simple things. Um, and like even worse, when you look at say ransomware and some of the more persistent threat actors, they're going after things like legacy infrastructure. They're going after, you know, um, uh, breached passwords that are still floating out there, sites that don't have multi-factor on it. And from my perspective, I don't think we are doing enough to get rid of that. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering, you know, first of all, how you think the federal government is doing on that side of it in terms of um, improving its own yeah. infrastructure, but also if you think there's anything that we can do, and when I say we, I mean the community we, yeah to try and solve this so that we take this low hanging fruit away from them? Yeah, it's a great question. So on the Fed government side, um, hopefully some folks got to listen in to the hearing earlier this week. My head of cyber, Eric Goldstein, did a great job in sort of laying out the progress that we've been making on the .gov, on the federal civilian executive branch over the past year since the executive order 14028 went out. Um, this is not a trivial endeavor, as you know. The FSEB is 101 
departments and agencies, and it's a very complicated space, you know, from your big agencies down to your micro agencies, which have all outsourced IT. So I, I feel like we are making good progress. We are moving in a good direction. We are modernizing. We are instantiating endpoint detection response capabilities. We're getting multi-factor. We're getting encryption. Um, but this is something that is going to take a while. And frankly, this is really about achieving one word, which is about visibility. We need to have visibility across the FSEB so that we can run analytics in a distributed way, ask those questions to understand malicious activity. So I think we're getting better, but we're on a journey. Um, and frankly, there's a lot more work to do, but I'm really proud of how much work has been done. And I think the team is ready to take it on. But um, this, again, is another big team sport because we have to work with our federal CISO partner, awesome Chris de Russia and Chris Inglis, and then all of our federal CIOs and CISOs together. And so I, I think there is great work going on, but Mark, there is a lot more work to do, as you can imagine. So, so that's the federal side. In terms of what you can do, so the other thing that we're working on um, with many of our alliance partners and some of our board, George Staphakopoulos, who's the, the chief security officer for Apple, is on my advisory board, and he is helping to lead a subcommittee on shaping uh, the technology ecosystem and really making, turning the corner on cyber hygiene, we call it. And, and that is a big deal. At the end of the day, some of these technology companies can actually make a big difference in helping to shape that ecosystem to make it more secure. Uh, one of the announcements that came out last week or last month, I think, um, uh, about moving to password lists, with Apple, Google, Microsoft, and working with the FIDO Alliance, which was awesome. Um, we're a big advocate of that. So we want to move in that direction. So we make it easy on consumers uh, to just be able to seamlessly protect themselves. So I think that's incredibly important. Um, and I'd welcome the work because there's a lot of technology companies that are part of the task force. And that's important. Uh, the other thing we talked a little bit about this before, Mark, but, you know, that um, tier of targets that are target rich, resource poor, your small businesses, your small hospitals, schools, municipalities that just don't have the resources or have to make a really tough decision between a dollar spent on modernizing legacy infrastructure and a dollar spent on a doctor, right. right? Really, really tough decisions to be made. And so we've done a lot with our partners over the past several months on free cybersecurity tools and services. If you go to Shields Up, you can actually go to pages and pages of these tools and services. But we're also trying to think of creative ways that we can develop partnerships with communities and maybe universities so that we can um, help to get at the root cause of this so that we can actually locally help to provide a capability for people to understand what they need to do and to respond if there is some sort of a, a breach or an attack or ransomware attack. So we're looking at some creative ideas. I would love to have you guys be part of that convo. I, I would love to because... You know, one of the themes that's come up throughout this entire um, event is getting real metrics on how many victims are out there. It's hard because most companies are disincentivized to come forward. They either engage with insurance and, and um, remediate that way, or if they don't have insurance and they're small, they just suck it up and move on. They don't see the value in coming forward and disclosing. And I'm not sure that uh, legislation is going to really change that picture for those entities. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, if we can start offering them support, if we can say, hey, you call us, we're going to send someone who's going to help you or we're going to connect you with a resource who's going to help you, yeah. then I think we will get a better picture. Yeah. And at the same time, we will make things a lot better and mitigate some of that harm. Yeah. Um, no, I think that's exactly right. Look, I, I think what people should understand about CISA. And again, we're the newest agency in the federal government. We were established by Congress to be America's cyber defense agency. Our entire North Star is about network defense, right? That's what we wake up in the morning. That's our mission. That's our dedication. And so we are not there to name, to shame, to blame, to kill somebody's reputation, to stab the wounded. We are entirely about rendering assistance, deploying resources, and being able to use what is you know, one of our best superpowers, which is information sharing in a way that protects liability, protects the victim, protects privacy and anonymity, but take that technical information so we can share it with others to prevent them from being hacked. 
that is our mission. And we were really trying to build on that. I think one of the coolest things about CISA, and I didn't even know this before I took this job, but we have this growing field force. So we have this growing force of cybersecurity advisors, cybersecurity state coordinators that we're building in regions all across the country who can be that front line, working with towns, working with uh, small critical infrastructure, hospitals, things like that. And so pairing what we have at CISA with our partners in the federal government and with the power of the task force and the hub, I think we can truly make some progress with some of those entities that just don't have the resources to really be able to protect themselves. Uh, absolutely agree. Um, I've been told we've oh. reached the, the end of our uh, session. So oh, thank you. Thank you for coming and, and spending this time with us. It, it was great. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody.